All right. So when I grow up, I want to work with animals. And hopefully this is most of you guys in today's session, because that's that's my target. Uh, that's the question we're going to hopefully answer today. Like um, the things that you can do when you guys go to work with animals and the things that uh, you might not have been able to consider um, prior to today. So if you want to, oh, we got another person coming into the waiting room. This is awesome. All right, so if you want to work with animals, do you already know what you want to be when you grow up? Um, many kids already have an idea what they want to be when they grow up. But if you're like me, I didn't know until I was 24 years old. And even then, I just thought, I'll just try this dog training thing and, and see if it pans out. It wasn't something I intended to do, but once I started doing it, I couldn't imagine doing anything else. Um, so how many of you guys think that you might want to work with animals but don't know exactly how? Hopefully we're going to inspire some of uh, some ideas for you guys when you guys get big. Um, there are lots of ways to work with animals. You can work with them full-time like I do. You can work with them part-time. Maybe you have another job and then you come back and you work with animals on the side. You could volunteer. So last week we talked a lot about um, therapy dogs and people had those dogs that could go into hospitals. That's a volunteer job, so you don't get paid for that. But you can take your personal dog and go into hospitals and, and help people feel better. Uh, you can work with people or just with animals, so there are lots of things. Researchers who study penguins, um, if you like adventure and you're curious about animals or a specific animal and you want to know everything you possibly can about those animals, you can maybe consider being a researcher. Um, now, these two probably work with a small team of people. They're not really working with the public so much. So if you would really rather work with animals and less with people, this might be a good option for you. And next slide. Here we go. <laughs> you would think I'd be better at this by now. So another thing to think about is what do you like, right? Do you like the idea of helping animals, like um, maybe in medicine, like a veterinarian or a vet tech, or entertainment, training animals for movies. We're gonna talk about those people today. Um, maybe farming, if you like working on a farm, if you're a city kid and you wanna live out in the country and farm. I have lots of friends who have moved on to, to rural life after living in a city. Um, maybe you wanna learn new things like a researcher or solve mysteries like a police officer who uses their dog to help them solve crime. Uh, law, you can change a lot of the laws out there that might be unjust by using animals. Uh, you can teach like I do. You can draw, write, and create. We're gonna talk about some cool people who have used those skills to be able to give them access to working with cool animals like hedgehogs and, and other animals or something else. So if there's a job that you want to do and somehow include animals in that work, you might be able to do both of those things. Um, so we're gonna see some of these in action today. But first, the first thing I really wanna talk to you guys about, and I think that this is maybe the most important. Um, lots of people like me got inspired by watching dog training on television. Um, so I got to see a lot of dog trainers do their work on TV and it was so cool to see these trainers come in and change behaviors like that. Um, and it's really great for inspiring people. And I, I know friends who have gone on to become veterinarians because they watched Animal Planet. Um, but it's really important to know that television and social media and YouTube are all great to start a spark and to get you excited about something, but it's entertainment. That is not real life. And, and education is not the same as inspiration. So it's going to be important to check your sources and to connect with people who actually do these jobs so you guys know how to do it right. And as a dog trainer, I take on a lot of kids and, and adults who are curious about what it's like to be dog training uh, in the dog training industry. And some of them come and they watch and they're like, that was so cool and I wanna do that when, I'm, when I grow up. And others come and they're like, wow, you guys clean up a lot more poop and you get peed on a lot more than I thought. I don't wanna do this job, but maybe I'll find another way to work with animals. And that's also totally valid. So getting in there and seeing if this is something that you really wanna sign up for is really, really important to see the good and the bad of these jobs. So do you need schooling or college or, or certifications to do some of these jobs? Well, the answer is it depends. 
Um, I went to a, a school uh, called Lake Erie College, and I specifically went to get into the equestrian world. Equestrian is another name for horse. I wanted to teach and train people to ride horses, specifically people um, who might have come back from war. Um, this was after September 11th, so I wanted to help soldiers coming back from the war to use therapy horses to start feeling better or to maybe get physically better as well. Um, I ended up not pursuing that path. Um, but my college roommate here, her name is Ruth, and she's super cool. She did pursue that path. She went on to continue working with horses. Um, and she did get her degree in equine sciences at Lake Erie College, but you don't necessarily need to. But the things that she learned have gone on to help her. Um, she trains horses and works with fox hunting dogs in the South. So she gets the best of both worlds. She gets to work with horses and dogs, which is super cool. Um, if you want to work with animals and you're curious about um, if you need a broader education, like after you're done with high school, maybe go to college. Um, if you're thinking about maybe doing animal training, like um, working in a zoo or a, um, an aquarium where they do the cool animal tricks, or like me, a dog trainer, um, psychology is a really great place to start. And anything that talks about learning theory or how the brain works, because the brain it works the same way in every mammal. The way I learn is the same way that Captain learns. Um, so learning theory is cross species, which is super cool. Um, if you like math or science and, and maybe how bones work together or the physiology of an animal, like, like how the muscles work and how the nerves work, uh, you might wanna consider being a veterinarian or a vet technician. And again, with equine sciences, you could maybe go and work with horses or like me, start working with horses and realize maybe that's not the path for you. It turns out horses hurt a whole lot when you fall off of them. So dogs are safer for me, but for Ruth, they were a great option for her. So regulation, like what things do you need? Do you need a license to do some of these jobs? Well, dog training currently is not regulated. You could go after today and say, I have looked at dogs. I'm seven years old, but I'm a dog trainer. And nobody can tell you that's wrong because it's an unregulated industry. So I work alongside other people like me who have certifications in my industry, but I also work alongside people who just love dogs and don't really know how animal training works. And they also get paid to be dog trainers. Um, that doesn't, there are big problems with that because some people can hurt dogs in the name of saying I'm teaching them, right? But there are benefits too, because I didn't know what I wanted to do when I grew up. I took this very low bar industry and went in. I could go in and you guys could go in and sit with dog trainers and learn how this works. Um, and nobody should turn you away for that. Um, so there are some good benefits. You can get in and see if you like it first, but there are some downsides too, and that you, if you don't know what you're doing, you can get in over your head really fast. Um, you can get some certifications in dog training, um, and some of them are more reputable than others. I always say to look for science-based uh, positive reinforcement dog training, which basically says, it has this been studied and can you prove it? And in general, that's a good way to go about like looking at most things. Can you prove it using data and science? Um, and the other thing that's really cool about if you wanted to do job training is a lot of the schooling or credentialing or certifications that you might look at or how to learn to be a job trainer can be done online. Um, it can also be done in person, but it can be done online, which has actually been very helpful during COVID. I'm actually teaching several trainers right now online. And the downside to that is that if they make a mistake, I might not see it because they're only sending me very short video clips, right? So they could edit it out just like those TV shows do. They edit out the boring stuff or they edit out the mistakes, which is why it's entertainment. But if I'm in person and I see that they're holding the leash wrong or they might be leaning forward too much and the dog is backing up because the dog's like, oh, I'm scared. Um, I could talk to that person a little bit more intimately and say, could you stand up a little bit? This is what's causing your dog to back up. And I could catch that in person, which I might not see online. So there are some pros and cons as well to being online with your training or in person. And the same goes for pretty much most industries. Um, but this is a picture of me teaching earlier this year. This is a tricks class. So what part of my job is teaching animals how to do cool tricks. And if I recall, I think they're working on 
learning what a flashlight is. So we, we taught them a word for an object. So flashlight, flashlight, flashlight. And then the next week we said book, book, book. And then two weeks after that, we would put both objects and say, which one's the flashlight? And the dog would point to the right one. So that was one of the tricks that we were working on in this picture. And some job, jobs are very regulated. This is a vet student. She is putting her hand up a cow's butt. Didn't know that was part of the job, did you? But this is something that you have to do. You have to be able to do an internal exam on a cow. Um, so veterinarians are medical doctors. They are also dentists. They are also nutritionists. They are also detectives because they're, their patient can't talk, so they have to look for clues of pain or discomfort. Uh, they're a birthing coach. If you have a pregnant cow or a pregnant cat, they have to be able to help with the birthing process. They're a boo-boo fixer, just like your mom or your dad, if you get a scrape, right? Or a cow up the bummer, like she's doing. Um, and then there's, and you have to go and get your uh, your degree in medical science to be a veterinarian. You can't, I can't just walk off the street today without any schooling and say I'm a vet, but I can as, if, as a dog trainer and the same for you. Um, certified applied animal behaviorist. That is another job that you need to have a doctorate degree after college. Uh, it's a lot of schooling, but you get a PhD in an animal related field like zoology or biology, and then you also get a certificate on top of that, a certification on top of that that says, I can go in and help with animal problems. So if I'm doing dog training and this dog needs a lot more help, like if you've ever gone to the doctor and you have a problem like with your family doctor, they can't figure out what's wrong and you need to see a specialist to really get down to the nitty gritty of that problem, that's kind of what I do as a dog trainer. If somebody comes in with a problem and they need help, I'll help them find the right person, including a certified applied animal behaviorist, if it's a very significant problem, to help them with their issue. So are you guys now ready? I know this has been a lot of talking for the preamble, but are you guys ready to find out some jobs that you guys can do when you guys get older? Um, so the way I broke this down are variations on a theme. So like if you wanted to help animals, but also work in medicine, like a veterinarian, we have some options here, and they're not all veterinarians. They're different degrees of working with dogs in a medically related field, um, or dogs or cats or horses or elephants, as you'll see. So these two boss ladies are dear, dear, dear friends of mine. Over here on the left with this tortoise is my sister from another mister, Dr. Sip. And she is awesome. She's removing a tumor off of this tortoise right now. Um, so when most people think of veterinarians, they might think uh, dogs and cats, maybe guinea pigs, right? But there are so many different kinds of veterinarians. Dr. Sip is a, an exotics veterinarian. So birds and rabbits and guinea pigs. And if you have a, a tarantula who's sick, she can help you with that. And most dogs and cat doctors can't fix tarantulas unless they also have this extra schooling and this is where I get in the weeds because I'm not a vet. <laughs> like, so I would probably direct you to talk to your vet if you're interested in doing exotics. Um, but there are, there are farm vets who work with large animals. Remember that vet student with her hand up the cow's bum, right? Like so they would help with horses and cows and big animals and those vets might not have uh, an animal hospital. They might drive to farms and work out of a van. So there are many uh, kinds of veterinarians. Um, so Dr. Sip, again, she's removing a lump off of a tortoise. Um, and then over here, we have um, my personal vet and dear friend, Dr. Sam. Now, Dr. Sam has helped me with my animals for the last 15 years. Um, and she works up at the Wakefield DCA. So if you guys are looking for a vet, she's amazing. But also on her days off, she volunteers her time at the MSPCA. Now, if you guys haven't heard of the MSPCA, I'm also a dog trainer there. Um, so Dr. Sam and I work in the same space, but we do two totally different jobs. Um, so while I do dog training, she fixes the broken animals and tries to make them feel better. Um, but she volunteers her time to help animals in shelters. So the MSPCA is a big shelter, um, and we're going to talk about them a little bit later in this presentation. But maybe you want to help wildlife and also um, be a veterinarian. Well, in that case, you would probably have to get 
a specific kind of certification and designation because wild animals are different than domestic animals. So these two can't fix wild animals. They could get in trouble for it, but they can fix uh, domestic animals that would live in your home. Um, but while this might look cool, I think it's super important to also show maybe the downside of the work that they do. So this next slide, it's going to have um, a uterus in it. And this big thing here is a uterus. That's uh, an internal organ to female animals, including people. And usually it's smaller than your hand for a dog the size that she's working on. But look at how big that is. That's an infection called a pyometra. And that's Dr. Sam, the woman from the earlier, uh, the doctor from the earlier slide. Um, the one with the bird on her head. She's doing a pyometra surgery. And what that is, a pyometra is a uterine infection that occurs in unspayed animals. So when I worked at an animal hospital as, an, as a receptionist, I thought I'm gonna be a vet. I wanna be a veterinarian. I wanna do what these cool women do. This is awesome. And then I saw my first pyometra surgery and I'm like, I'm out. <laughs> and I decided that wasn't for me. But that's how I eventually found dog training, right? I found the things that didn't work, but kind of stuck with in the same theme. And I eventually found the thing that I love more than anything. And Dr. Sam saw this pyometra and was like, no, no, I'm still in. This is still really cool. And I still want to help this animal. So when you're looking to work with animals or when you're looking to work in anything, you have to take the good with the bad. So while I work closely with veterinarians now as a dog trainer, I'm not a vet and I cannot diagnose anything medically, um, but Dr. Sam can. And she can't really give dog training advice, but she can help you with your pyometra <laughs> like, or your animal's pyometra. Um, you see some pretty gnarly things as a veterinarian, but you also get to see some really cute things here. This is that same veterinarian who was working on the tortoise, my friend Sip, and these are two super cute guinea pigs that she gets to help with because she's an exotic vet. So that's just a couple of things to keep in mind if you guys are looking at being a veterinarian or if that's, but being a veterinarian isn't the only option out there. This is another college friend of mine. So remember Ruth with the horses. This is my friend, Melissa Grimm. She's a certified vet tech. Um, I believe she's in Seattle. I forgot to double check. That. <laughs> um, but they work alongside veterinarians, almost like the nurses. So if you want to heal animals, without your hand up the business end of a cow, and you like dry land, maybe a vet tech is going to be for you. So they help with dental procedures, dental work, they help with vaccinations, they can help take x-rays, they can help with anesthesia monitoring. So when the animals go to sleep for surgery, they watch the medicine and to make sure that they're getting the right amount of medicine to keep them asleep so they're comfortable for surgery. Um, they educate owners about proper pet care. So they do a little bit of teaching like I do. Um, and they talk to worried and excited owners to help them out because having animals can be hard. If some of you guys have animals, you know when they're sick, it can be really scary. Um, so they help you with that too. So they have some skills like science and patience. My goodness, these guys have the patience of a saint. And they have to be able to work with people in the public and they educate the public one-on-one -on -one as well. If you want to help animals but think outside the box, these guys are super cool. This is a skill, uh, this is a job called hydrotherapy. And these are physical therapists that help animals. And in this particular case, this is a baby elephant who lost her front leg in a trap. Um, she lost part of her foot due to infection. And the veterinarians could cure the infection, but because the surgery was so hard on this baby elephant, she had to relearn how to walk. And if you haven't tried to help a baby elephant walk, they're really big, even as babies. So you can use water to help get the muscles to work and to get them moving. Um, so she needed these skilled humans to help her learn how to walk again, and she did. Um, and I've sent some of my um, dog students and Dr. Sam and Dr. Sip have sent some of their medical clients to see hydrotherapists as well to maybe help with dogs who have arthritis or older dogs who need some physical exercise or dogs who had surgery that can't run but need to work those muscles. Hydrotherapy is really cool. There used to be a, um, there are some hydrotherapy options here in the Boston area. Um, and at MSPCA, they do send some of their clients there as well. And so 
this is just one part of maybe a physical therapy plan. So if you don't want to go and do the whole vet thing, the whole vet school thing, but you like the idea of still helping animals medically, but don't want to work in an animal hospital, you want something a little more exciting, this might be a way to do it. And this can be worked in tandem with acupuncture and canine massage and this whole idea of physiotherapy by using water. Um, you have to know the anatomy of these animals and several animals. So like you have to know like how the knee bone connects to the shin bone, but you also need to know how uh, nerves work and the spine works and how injuries affect different parts of the body and how those musculoskeletal uh, pains can affect an animal's behavior and then see if you can try to help these animals feel comfortable in water. Um, and you do need a certificate or certification to do this work, as far as I'm aware. So if you don't want to work in the medical field, but you want to work with animals, and you are curious and you love discovering new things, well, we have some options for you here. You can help the public and still work with dogs. Um, if you guys um, have ever seen this thing called Twitter, um, I put out a call to see if we could find some really cool animal jobs and somebody sent me this guy. Um, this is his last day on the job, working as part of a fire dog investigation team. So what that is, is like sometimes there are fires and, and they're really awful and sad and tragic. Um, and sometimes they're electrical and sometimes things happen. But sometimes some people will set fires on purpose. Um, and so these dogs are trained to sniff out accelerant, which is a chemical that you can use to make a fire go faster and higher. So if you've ever watched your parents maybe make, um, make a fire, like a bonfire or, or cooking on a grill, you might see like a chemical they spray and then they light it and go, poof, that's an accelerant. Accelerant means it makes it go faster. Um, and so some people will put accelerant and, and commit the crime of arson. So this guy will use these trained dogs to help find and sniff accelerant, just like the dogs last week we were talking about can find cancer and can find all sorts of cool things. Um, so you can work on two sides of a, of a job like this. As an animal trainer, I could train the dogs to go and work on a fire dog investigation team, which would be really, really fun for me. I think that would actually be really fun and I would really be excited by that. Or if you're a firefighter who wants to solve these crimes, you can become a firefighter and then once you're there, get extra certification and extra schooling and extra knowledge in engineering, if you really like engineering and seeing how things piece together. Um, and you can take one of these trained dogs to be your partner in solving these cases. So there are a couple of different ways that you can work with those dogs. If you want to help the public and work with dogs, but you don't want to set things on fire or be anywhere near fire, well, dogs can sniff out many things, not just cancer, not just malaria, not just um, uh, arson, uh, or chemical accelerants, I got there. They can also sniff out dead bodies. I think this is so exciting. Cadaver dogs is what these guys are called. And often you'll see cadaver dogs if you have um, if you have a crime, like you might send out a cadaver dog, they can find the bones of missing people, which is really sad, but for those families to, to be able to have closure, it's really, really important. And without these dogs, those families won't have closure. But by using these cadaver dogs, they had discovered that they can work with archaeologists to find like cities that are buried under the ground and 300 year old graves in Croatia. Um, so these dogs are now teaming up. These cadaver dogs are finding um, are finding the bones of people or remnants of people from 3000 years ago. That's how powerful their noses are. And I just, I geek out about it because I think it's so cool. They have this superpower that we don't have. <laughs> um, so they can sniff out um, search and rescue if you don't want to work with, um, with cadavers. You could maybe handle as a volunteer for search and rescue. So if somebody goes missing, you could handle dogs. You get a call at three in the morning, we need you and your dog, and you go out and you start looking. Your dog is trained to find the scent of the missing. Um, or if they uh, suspect a death, they would send out a cadaver dog. 
but not always are they volunteers. Sometimes your dog can go to work with you and that would be a bed bug detection dog. So those dogs can go and go through hotels and find bed bugs or other, uh, other insects, other pests. Um, they can go through homes. Um, my dog captain who was howling at the very beginning before we started recording, um, he's found ant infestations in our home twice in the same week. That was a bad week, um, but we were able to address it. And he wasn't trained on it. He just started alerting because he could smell something in the walls. And then when I hit the wall and all the ants fell out, we were like, oh, we got to call someone. So dogs are really keen on, on things that are new in their environment. So let's say you wanna work with animals, um, but maybe you're more interested in more exotic animals like wildlife. Well, you could help wildlife by becoming a wildlife rehabilitator. So you can help sick and injured, orphaned animals get healthy and get them released back out into the wild. Um, if they can't safely be returned to nature, you can still use those animals in education and start teaching people about them. So like at the Stone Zoo, if you guys have ever been, or if you know somebody who's gone, they have these two eagles. And one of them had been, if I recall the story correctly, I believe he was shot um, and was so badly injured, he couldn't go back into the wild. Um, so he's in this zoo and he does bird presentations to show how cool and majestic and large these birds are. So kids can learn about these animals he can still live and, and help other eagles by educating kids. Um, you need to know about different kinds of animals because if you find a bird, uh, that might be different than finding a wild bear cub. So they would need different things, different foods, different environments, different protocols. Um, so you need to have uh, a working knowledge of biology, maybe learning theory, because if a stressed out animal is coming at you, how do you get its trust without breaking its wildness? Um, and teaching, if you like the teaching part of it, um, you can teach kids like you um, about these super cool animals. Oh no, I lost the, there's a, oh, I'm really bummed out. This was supposed to be a picture of a, um, of a cheetah, let me see if I can. Um, but this is a woman named Tori O'Connor, and she's getting her PhD. She's in the psychology department at Oakland University, and she studies co uh, comparative cognition in carnivores, which basically means the intelligence and how their brain works between different kinds of carnivores, like cheetahs versus lions. So she gets to study them both, which is super cool. So like if I put out a box of food in an empty box, would how fast is it before the lion can get to the right box of food compared to the cheetah? Um, things like that. So if you like working with wild animals and you don't really want to teach, you just want to do your thing and dive into a good book and dive into research and really just study and do something cool about understanding animals, maybe being a research biologist is going to be for you. Um, and this can work if you're more interested in the psychology aspect of it or the physical biology of it. Like, how do these animals work? Um, oh, there it is. Do you see it? Okay, cool. I, I must have set up an animation on accident somehow. Um, but this is her and this is her job. And if you're curious about like any of her research that she's working on, her website is here, victorialoconnor.weebly.com. And I do have some resources on the slides at the very end. If you guys want to screenshot it, there should be a button that says print screen. And you can hit it when I get there and you guys should be able to see. And that way you guys can go back and look at all of these um, things on your own if this sparks some curiosity. So let's say you want to help animals and you're also interested in the law. Well, if you want to help animals and you like law enforcement and you like languages, they need you. <laughs> um, so learning foreign languages can actually be a real benefit, especially if you like helping animals, because like we have so many animals and so many cultures represented in the United States, that being able to bridge, um, bridge different cultures within our own communities can be really helpful. So if you're a veterinarian and you speak Spanish, you're in high demand. Um, but here in this case, if you like languages and law enforcement, you want to help animals. This, I do like talking about this, but it is important to know that you do see the worst of people, which is really hard. Um, 
you, but when you are saving these animals out of like really horrible conditions, it can be so great for these animals and for the people who love them. Um, so you can help get animals out of really bad situations like animal fighting rings or hoarding cases um, or in breeding facilities. Have, if you guys have heard of the term puppy mill, that's where, um, th this is why I usually advocate don't just buy a, a pet off the internet because you don't know where they come from. They might be coming from these puppy mills where uh, mom has babies but they're in like a small cage and they just live in this cage the whole time until they're ready to be sold and it's really really sad but law enforcement can go in and help get those animals out and get them homed and give them appropriate houses and appropriate care which is what all animals deserve so if if seeking in uh seeking and fixing injustice is something that's really exciting to you this might be an option so what I'm going to do, I'm going to show you guys one more slide. Um, I'm going to give you guys a bit of a warning. There's no physical injuries to these two animals that I'm going to show, but it does kind of show two animals that have been significantly neglected. Um, they both ended up at the MSPCA where I work. Um, and I just want to talk about these cases because if you are interested in doing this, I think it's important to see some of what you're going to end up running into but there's nothing too gruesome. But if you think that you still might be upset, you can close your eyes or turn away from the screen or go get a soda or a drink or something and then come right back and I will tell you when I'm off the slide. All right, so in three, two, one. So this is a dog that was brought in from a hoarding case and see how skinny this dog is, right? They shouldn't be that skinny. So this was a dog that hadn't been fed. So when law enforcement went in, they brought her to the MSPCA where they were able to give her appropriate care and nutrition and food. I think she had puppies, if I recall. I can't remember if it was her or the other dog. Um, but this was a really, really bad case in Massachusetts. And this horse over here too, this was also a particularly bad case where two horses were taken. Um, they had lived in stalls and kept pooping in the stalls and nobody cleaned them out. So they got locked in their stalls by poop. Um, and you can see here their feet. Um, feet shouldn't look like that on a horse. You need to make sure, like if your nails kept growing, that their feet are made out of the same thing as our nails. If your nails kept growing, they would end up looking kind of funky and gnarly and get in your way and be annoying. But for horses, because they walk on them, this can deform their feet. And of the two horses, one of them, her foot was so deformed by not having appropriate care that she unfortunately had to be euthanized, but the other one was able to be saved. Um, and law enforcement was able to get in and relieve these animals suffering and make sure that they were able to find good homes or be humanely euthanized, that way they didn't suffer anymore. Um, so if you're interested in law enforcement, you do see humanity at their worst because people did this to these animals, but you can help these animals in a significant way. And I'm off the slide in the event that you guys had to turn away. Now, similarly to the to working in law enforcement with animals, if you like science-based dog training like me and forensics, um, this is a great job if you like solving puzzles, but you have a stomach of steel. Because again, you're going to see really, really horrible things done to animals and maybe even to people by animals, but you have to solve the puzzle. You have to find out what happened, especially if the either a victim or a person or the animal can't speak. Um, so if you appreciate dogs and behavior and you like advanced study, and this is Jim Crosby, he's a retired police officer who uses forensic science and his dog training and behavior certification. So he's got a lot of background, right? Um, but he helps victims of dog bites find justice, um, but he also helps animals that have been abused by people. And if the people are lying about how an animal got hurt, he jumps in and says, no, there's no way that this story lines up with these injuries, we're going to take this dog because you've hurt it in a really bad way. So he helps so many animals and people using forensics. Um, and again, they see people at their worst and they might even see animals behaving at their worst, often at the fault of humans, but they're able to get answers and prevent future injury and harm done to those people and animals, which is super cool. 
But if you want to look um, and maybe the less gruesome side of working in the law side with animals, you can do what Joyce Tischler does. And she's so cool. And I, and I hope we talked a little bit about Rebel Girls last week and like um, the Eagle Huntress, if you guys remember that part of the conversation. I really hope that they end up doing a Rebel Girls on her because she's so cool. She's the mother of animal law. Um, she went to law school. She loves animals. She probably loves a good argument given that she's a lawyer. Um, so if you like debate team, if you go into high school and you try debate team, um, or theater and public speaking, because you have to be able to stand up and present an argument uh, to maybe make the laws better for animals, and you have to love animals. Um, if you guys want to know what being an animal rights lawyer is all about, I'm going to have that also in the resources, but there's a great video of her, just her daily life. And the neatest thing, and you guys might not have noticed this, but behind her, do you guys see this chimpanzee and this woman here with the gray hair? That is Jane Goodall, and she, she has done so much for animals, especially chimpanzees and environmental um, law and environmental uh, advocacy. Um, and it's cool to see that Joyce Tischler's hero, it appears, is Jane Goodall, who is one of my heroes too. So what if you want to teach and work with animals? Well, there's a couple of different ways you can do that. Well, there are many, many ways you can do that. So let's say you really like movies and TV or even theater um, and you want to train animals. Well, that's what animal trainer Teresa Ann Miller has done. Um, she, she's here on the set of White God, which had, I believe if I read correctly, 250 dogs on set. Um, so she gets to use her animal training and uh, be a part of movies with these dogs and cats and raccoons. She talked about her dad, who was also an animal trainer for the movies. And she's like, well, one day we had a raccoon in our house and another day we had a seal in our bathtub because the next day they needed a seal on set. And so like she would go to bed and there'd be a seal in her bedroom or her bathroom. Um, but as a trainer, no matter where you're at, you have to advocate for your animal and being on set can be really, really stressful. So you have to make sure that actor and director egos are not a problem, uh, but you also have to be able to understand stress signals in people and in the animals you're working with. So if the animal is blinking a lot and turning their head away, that's too much pressure for those dogs or animals. So you have to be very skilled at timing. And when you watch, if you watch any of the videos that I teach animals, I'm usually really close to the animal that I'm working at, but she has to communicate offset and be like, sit, down and maybe just use hand signals to communicate to a dog who's on set with somebody else. So it's really cool and you have to be an excellent trainer to pull this off. And again, you have to know learning theory and like I said, psychology is a really great place to start if that's something that you're interested in. Now let's say you want to teach all animals. You don't want to be limited to dogs or cats. And you also want to use that teaching to help save animals. Well, here's this cool guy named Ken Ramirez, and I've seen him speak. He actually came and spoke to some dog trainer friends of mine a few years ago. And he, you see these butterflies here? I, this is one of the coolest things that I've ever heard. So there was a, a presentation where, or a ceremony of some sort, where they wanted to have three groups of butterflies trained to fly over, so white butterflies would fly over the field going one direction, blue butterflies would fly the other, and red butterflies would fly through both groups. So the only way to get this to work was to train the butterflies when they were caterpillars to go to a specific colored target. So white ones would go to maybe a white target, blue ones to a blue target, red ones to a red target. So if they hit the right target as caterpillars, they would get their favorite food at that target. And then the target would get further and further. So you have like all these caterpillars crawling across this field trying to get to the target. So then the butterflies went through metamorphosis. And here's the, here's the thing that has always stuck with me and I've never forgotten it. When a caterpillar goes through metamorphosis to become a butterfly, their bodies turn to goo. And then they reform as a butterfly. Could you imagine like your whole body just turning into mush and reshaping and blue? So when the butterflies hatched, they wanted to see if they remembered their target, and they did, which makes scientists think that butterflies remember 
turning into goo in the chrysalis and then coming out on the other side, which is fascinating and also kind of horrifying that <laughs> that's a thing that they would remember. Um, but all of the butterflies remembered it. So they put the three targets out and they released the butterflies and they did, they were able to fly to the right one from across a stadium to the right color. Um, and Ken Ramirez was the one who figured out how to do that. Um, here he is working with a seal. He used to work at the Shedd Aquarium in Chicago, training seals and belugas and all sorts of cool animals. Um, he taught wild chimps to respond to approaching humans with warning cries to save them from poachers, which is also really important work. So he's really interested in uh, conservation and wild animals, but also finding interesting ways to educate the public while still advocating for animals. So I, this is one of the coolest people, if you're interested in dog training, to look up, Ken Ramirez. And if you like teaching and domestic uh, animals and people and public speaking, you can do what I do. I like teaching kids about dogs and cats. That's why I'm here talking to you today. <laughs> and sometimes other animals too. I got to look up all of these things over the last three weeks about seeing eye horses and flying butterflies and arson detection dogs and Croatian bomb bees from last week. And I never would have had the opportunity to do that if you guys didn't want somebody to talk to you guys about animals. So I can't thank you guys enough for inviting me for the last three weeks to be able to talk to you about the cool things that animals do because I didn't know most of this going in. Um, my job is working with dogs. So my worldview for animals is very small. Um, and here I am presenting at the Museum of Science earlier this year before COVID shut it down. Um, about dogs and the cool things that they can find with their noses. And I had brought my dog, Captain, who you heard earlier today howling. Um, and we took a little tin that had a Q-tip in it that had been soaked in birch oil and we hid it and we would send him out and he would find it with his nose. And he would demonstrate how powerful and how cool their noses are. Um, and my friend brought her dog and we demonstrated with two dogs for about a half an hour. I think we did about 10 presentations. It was by far the highlight of my career being able to go to my favorite place on the planet the museum of science here in boston be able to talk to kids with my dog in the museum it was so fun um and while that might sound fun to me that might not sound fun to you if you don't like public speaking or teaching or uh or giving presentations about dogs this would maybe seem like a nightmare um, but that's why it's important to know like the things that you like and how you can use that to work with animals if that's something that you really want to do. Um, so how do you get into this line of work or others? Well, look at other people in the industry. Uh, if you like dog training, there are online courses that are based in evidence and science, not just listening to some guy at the dog park or some guy on the internet. It's really important to know what credentials they have and what they need. So my certification, CPDT, Certified Professional Dog Trainer, and I had to sit for a four-hour test on learning theory and ethology and ethics and teaching style and equipment, and animal husbandry, and all of these things. So I had to work really hard to get that certification. Um, and that's different than somebody who just picks up a leash and says, I'm a dog trainer. Um, so it's really important to know what those words mean. What are your favorite subjects in school? Do you like theater? Like I was a theater kid and I loved it. Um, maybe you like science, maybe you like math or history. If you like history, that archeological dog big thing, that would be so fun for you maybe. If you like dogs and archeology span and discovery. Um, find someone else in the line of work that you're looking at and ask them a lot of questions. Like I said, I've had kids and adults come and sit through my classes and ask me lots of questions and some really clung to every word and were like, this is what I want to do. And others, the more I talk, the more they're like, this actually doesn't sound as interesting as I thought. And I think it's really important to figure out if what you want to do is really what you want to do when you find out the bad sides of it too. Um, and read, 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 read. Like for dog training, I would recommend the other end of the leash, maybe Canine Confidential, some books by um, Ken Ramirez, um, I have my book in here because I also got to write a book. I love writing and I love dogs. So I got to write a book and that was really fun too. Um, so if there's something you like, there's a place for you.
but what if your job doesn't exist? Well, let me introduce you to somebody that I'm actually proud to call friends, Lily Chin. Um, Lily is an artist who used to work in illustration and on the WB network for cartoons, illustrating and animation. And she ended up with this dog, Bogey, who he, he got, he was really scared of a lot of things. And Lily uh, discovered some of the training methods that she was using that she saw on television were making her dog feel worse, which is why it's really important not to just watch TV. You have to talk to a professional. Um, she ended up realizing the things that she was consuming on TV and the things that she was doing to her dog were hurting her dog. So she went to somebody who had a certification in animal behavior and was able to figure out, oh, wait, my dog is telling me he's scared when he looks like this, like this little dog here in this middle poster. So she decided that she would reach out to other animal trainers and vet behaviorists. Um, there's a famous one, Sophia Yin, that she reached out to. And they started to collaborate on making informational posters using Lily's extraordinary illustration talent to help kids and dogs. And here's the cool thing about Lily. If she didn't exist and she didn't do this, she was the first one to really make uh, these illustrations in a way that kids could understand, that adults could understand, that my clients could understand. Um, you can take pictures of dogs, but sometimes you can miss the subtlety of what dogs are saying with their bodies, but her illustrations are so clear. I couldn't do my job nearly as well if it wasn't for Lily stepping up and saying, my job doesn't exist yet, I'm going to make it exist. And she did, and she has saved, and I'm not even kidding, thousands of dogs um, just by getting information out in a new way that is appropriate for people of all ages to understand. Um, and I use her posters and her illustrations to talk to kids all the time and to talk to adults. Um, so to me, she's one of my heroes because she saw something and tried to fix it. Now she also illustrates books. Um, and here's one of Aislinn's favorite, Aislinn's my daughter, William to the Rescue, that was also created by another go-getter named Sassafras Lowry. And she decided, you know what? I want to make these books about rescue dogs for kids to consume at night to educate them about rescue dogs, but in a fun story way. And so she teamed up with Lily and made a book happen. So if your job doesn't exist, make it exist. There is space for you and your creativity. If you're creative or you're, you have a way to present information in a new way to help people, this might be an awesome avenue for you. But there is space for everyone at the table. Um, and I did include this picture here down here at the bottom. This is from William to the Rescue and I included it for a very special reason. Lily hid my book over here on this little book uh, shelf here. So this book is Inside a Dog by Dr. Alexander Horowitz. So if you want to know how their noses work, this is where I get a lot of my information. So he's reading that and then she put in like this little Easter egg of like some other books that she happened to have and mine was included in that illustration. And it just made me so happy to stumble onto it while I was reading it to my daughter. So here are the resources for today. Oh no, my battery is running low. Hold on one second. Here we go. Here's where I got today's information. And I would, if you want, you guys can totally just hit print screen on your computer or flag your parents over. I'll let this sit here for a minute. Um, but if you wanted to learn more about how to become a fire investigator or follow Rex the fire dog on Twitter uh, or scent detection or archaeology dogs, I put the biomedical detection dogs in here from last week, the COVID dogs and the, the malaria dogs. I put that in here too because I do think that they link up really nicely with the search and rescue dogs. Um, but that's here. And then how to train animals for film. There's like this great article that you can listen to um, on NPR. Um, there's wildlife animal researcher, wildlife rehabilitator. I'm going to go to the next slide. The I can't. Warrior. Oh, one second. Uh, healing animals and hydrotherapy. And props to Gemma Rashida on Twitter who told me about this. Um, I, the little elephant in the water is getting fixed. Uh, training presentations and animal training with Ken Ramirez. 
So what do you want to be when you grow up? This kid here on the left grew up to teach dogs to play Frisbee, write a book about living with urban dogs, and help thousands of people in Metro Boston with their pets. Um, so you guys have a long road in front of you, and it can be very exciting. And if animals are a part of it, I think there's nothing more exciting than working with animals to do your job. It certainly makes things interesting and fun. Uh, no day is ever boring, but it's hard work. Um, and I wish you guys all the best of luck if this is the journey that you guys are on. And you can always email me um, or reach out to me personally. I think Heather had my info somewhere. I will make sure that you guys get it if you want it. Um, and I will help you guys get in touch with the people that if you want to be a vet, I can connect you to vets. If you guys want to do scent work, we can connect you with people who do scent work. So we can, I will work with you to try to find somebody if you have a lot of questions about some of these. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to stop my share. Um, and I'm going to stop my recording here. And